Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Buhali, Doc Montana, and Matt Gould. In each episode of the Survivalist Podcast, we look at different events and catastrophes that could happen to you. Then we give you the knowledge, resources, and recommendations you need to survive. The Survivalist Podcast is brought to you by Forge Survival Supply. Find peace of mind for your family at Forge Survival Supply. Founded by United States Marine Corps veterans, Forge is the premier destination for quality, American-made survival and emergency preparedness products. Freeze-dried foods, water filtration, fire starters, fully equipped bug-out bags. Find everything your family needs to stay safe, protected, and nourished during times of uncertainty at ForgeSurvivalSupply.com. As a listener of this program, Forge Survival Supply would like to give you an additional 10% savings. That's right, an additional 10% off your entire order, plus free shipping by entering discount code SURVIVOR at checkout. That's ForgeSurvivalSupply.com and use discount code SURVIVOR. This podcast is sponsored by Epic Water Bottles and Pitchers. Every year, millions of Americans get sick from drinking contaminated water. Epic Water Filters remove chlorine, heavy metals chemicals, industrial pollutants, pesticides and herbicides, iodine, and microbiologicals from your water. All of this is done with BPA-free, recyclable bottles and pitchers that are made in the USA. So keep your family safe and healthy with Epic Water. Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast. I'm Matt Gould, and I'm here with Doc Montana as usual. How you doing, Doc? Doing well. How are you? I'm great, and I'm really excited because today uh, we have a guest, Jason Hansen. So Jason spent nearly a decade at the Central Intelligence Agency, where he won the CIA's Exceptional Performance Award twice. How are you, Jason? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for coming on. And uh, so, Jason, you founded Spy Escape and Evasion in 2010, right? And that's a company that teaches men and women how to be safe using spy secrets that 99% of Americans will never know. Yeah, that's accurate. How do you use spy skills to keep safer? And I heard you say you don't need to spend 10 years becoming a black belt. You need to know how to be situationally aware, how to use defensive tools and techniques, and learn the inside secrets to using these techniques to stay safe, uh, which I'm really, really int- intrigued with. And on top of that, you have a, um, a training course that you do. You have a spy ranch, right? And uh, you want a deal on Shark Tank. Correct, yeah. I, I got a deal with Damon John on Shark Tank. And we have a 320-acre facility out here called Spy Ranch where we do evasive driving and escape and evasion and intelligence operative courses and all kinds of fun stuff. Oh, that's fantastic. So there's so much that I I would like to talk to you about, but uh, why don't we start with, I think, just a very hot topic. Uh, You know, I know you have young children. I have three daughters myself. And so a hot topic that I'm always talking to my daughters about is how to avoid an an abduction. I guess talk about first, like, why would people get abducted and where does that usually happen? Yeah, uh, obviously, you know, it's completely different. Is the person a celebrity or a politician who is a target of an abduction and they've been washed for weeks and kind of hunted and stalked, or is it just a crime of opportunity? Is it that sicko walking through the park or the county fair and sees some little boy or little girl and snatches them? So, again, it really it depends. You know, my kids, my kids were very young. My oldest is four, and then I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. And I've still taught the four-year-old and two-year-old things. And, of course, it's more stranger danger of fall to the ground, you know, kick, scream, yell, bite, that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, because of social media, we see these things a lot more, but there's a ton of sickos. Even in small-town USA where I live, there's been attempted kidnappings. So I think the biggest thing is is, Know what can happen anywhere. Teach your kids something, you know, appropriate age level. So if you're 15, you can teach them a lot more than obviously if they're two. And then probably the number one thing is always going to come down to keeping your head up. I was on an airplane yesterday because I travel all the time doing training. And, you know, everybody's staring at their phone or got their head down. And the one uh, flight attendant's like, you know, sir, would you like something to drink? Sir, would you like something to drink? And the guy's just, you know, off in no man's land, as most people are. And when I take my young kids to the park, you know, I'll be standing there and I'll see the moms on the park bench and they're staring at their iPhones and kids could get snatched in a second. So people just got to got to use more common sense. It's, it's relatively easy, but nobody does it. Yeah, I, I think you call that situational awareness. Is that that's what you'd call it or that's what I would call it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can. That's absolutely what it is. I mean, in the spy world. 
we were going to, I mean, you may ask this question later about how do you know if you're being followed and all that kind of stuff. But in the spy world, you have to be very alert. So what I'm going to say is, of course, hypothetical, but let's say you, for instance, Matt, were an intelligence operative. You're going, you're in a foreign country, you're going to be an asset. So you're going to go meet somebody who you're hoping to convince to spy on behalf of the United States, or maybe they already work for the U.S. So you don't just go out of your house and drive straight to your meeting because if somebody's following you, then that asset is compromised. Both of you could be killed, and most likely your asset's going to be killed if you've got diplomatic immunity. So what you do in the spy world is something called an SDR, which stands for Surveillance Detection Route. And that is a very fancy term for saying you don't go from straight from uh, point A to point B. You're going to go to Starbucks, then you're going to go to the gym, then you're going to go to Walmart, then you're going to go to your final meeting location. And at all these locations you're going to, you're going to see if anything stands out, if you notice the same car twice, if you need the same person twice. And you're going to be very aware because obviously you don't want them to know you're a spy. And two, you don't want them to lead you or you don't want to lead them to this asset that's giving the United States a ton of knowledge. So SDRs, you obviously have to be incredibly situational aware, and they save people's lives. And I'll give you another very quick example of how anybody can do this, since you know probably most people are not in the CIA right now. Uh, <laughs> super quick example, my wife is at Home Depot a few weeks ago. She says there's this guy who she's pretty sure is staring at her and he's acting creepy. So she's in one aisle. She says, I walk to another aisle. And two minutes later, this guy's in that aisle. Then I go to a completely different area. And two minutes later, that guy's in this aisle. And each time, he's not picking anything up. He's not, he doesn't have a shopping cart. I go to one more aisle. That guy ends up there two minutes later. So clearly, he is following her because it's not coincidence that the same creepy guy is going to be in the four different aisles that are totally random my wife went to. So she ended up walking to customer service. She had somebody who escorted her to the car. She never saw the guy again, made sure he wasn't following her home. But that is how an average American can quickly and easily run a surveillance detection route to know if some creepy guy is trying to stalk him in Walmart or in the shopping mall. So, Jason, I've heard uh, in the spy craft there are no coincidences, and if you see something twice, it's, it's a thing. It's not an accident. Is there, there truth to that? Yeah, there's a like saying, right? Sounded... It's funny. I, I, no, as you were saying that, there is a saying, and I was trying to remember in my mind, and now I'm going to butcher it, but it's something like, you know, one time could be nothing, two times is coincidence, three times is enemy action. So, you know, it's all how you look at it. But, yeah, if I see somebody, you know, if I'm starting my day and I see somebody following me and they happen to go to the same Walmart, okay, but then if I go to my next location and the Starbucks, well, then it's off. I'm convinced I'm being followed. You know, I'm going to be very, very careful. So you're 100% right. You have to be ultra, ultra suspicious and careful. And in our world now, the civilian world, quote unquote, you got to worry about the bad guy. You got to worry about the kidnapper, the, uh, you know, creepy guy following you out to rob you or carjack you. In the spy world, you've obviously got to worry about people torturing you and kidnapping. So the stakes are very high, so you don't want to take any chances. If you do think somebody's following you, do the right thing and, you know, alert police, don't go home, all that kind of stuff. Well, I was thinking that your wife, you said it was four different aisles. Maybe being married to you, is she thinking that she's got an overactive imagination, so she better be correct and kind of not only assume something's wrong, like maybe after the first or second experience with that creepy guy that, in fact, she was going to make sure by testing it beyond the, what maybe the average person might do, where after two yeah, I mean, aisles, they say something's wrong. Yeah, actually, women are very intuitive. They're, they're much more intuitive and detail-oriented than us guys were or are. So, yeah, she was double-checking. She said, hey, I had to go to several different aisles, so I might as well go to them. And they were, again, completely different aisles to get items, and he showed up in every single one. So by that time, she was 100% sure she was being followed. And the thing is, you know, all of that probably took less than 10 minutes, and she had to go shopping anyway. Um, you know, another instance, real quick, I had a woman who was shopping, I think it was Macy. She was in the shoe department. And she said, there's this creepy guy staring at me in the shoe department, which, you know, what guy in his right mind wants to be in the shoe department unless his wife is dragged in there? And <laughs> so she said, I went from the shoe department to perfume, and this guy ended up in the perfume department two minutes later. And then I went perfume to, I think, clothing, and the guy was there. So she, all she did was go from shoes to perfume to clothing. Same guy appeared each time. 
she said she got a security guard who happened to be right nearby. And when the security guard, she went to him and pointed the guy out, he took off running and they never saw him again. So it really is, it's not labor intensive if it's not time intensive. And most people, if they had their heads up, would notice them being followed. You hear those horrific stories of people getting followed out in the Walmart parking lot or some parking lot where if they had their head up, they would notice these guys probably following them all around the mall or all around Walmart or wherever they may be. Right. And I was going to say another thing that, you know, uh, since we're a survivalist podcast, a lot of times we think about extreme situations where sort of rule of law is broken down and you're, and you're out, you, you know, you, there, there is no uh, government as security to rely on. So if, just hypothetically, if you were in that type of scenario, uh, I imagine it's very different. If you think someone's following you, they're pro- you know, you're probably, they're probably hiding or something like that, probably more like you see in spy movies. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, speaking of you're all on your own, you know, every day where I legally can, and thankfully I live in the state of Utah, which is very gun friendly, I've either, either got a SIG P238 in my front pocket or a Springfield 1911 on my hip. I got my pocket knife, tactical pen, um, you know, I got my lockpick sets, bobby pins, hair breadth. It's all in a belt, so it doesn't take up much space, so that stuff. But yeah, if nobody is around, then I've got to defend myself. I'm very well prepared. I train every day with my firearm that kind of stuff. So, yeah, obviously you're not always going to have the security of Macy's or some, you know, security at Walmart around. So, yeah, that's, of course, why you've got to be protected, why you've got to know some very simple self-defense moves to take care of yourself. Yeah. Or if you're out in the woods camping or something and you, you suspect that someone's following you, you know, but staying hidden while following you, is there any way to detect that? Well, I mean, if, they're, if you're dealing with the pros – and you're uh, an average person who is, again, I don't want to say la-la land, but most people aren't paying zero attention. You're never going to see these pros. But if you're out in the woods, you're camping, you're hiking, you think you're being followed, it's first you better, have, better be armed or better have something on you. But the moment you think something's gone wrong, start heading back to your car. Start heading back to civilization. And if, you know, maybe they're not hiding, but you just, you're on a bike trail or a jogging trail, the best thing you can do is actually confront that person. It's kind of counterintuitive. So if you're walking somewhere in the woods or you're hiking on a bike trail and you think somebody's following you and there are other people on this trail so you're not sure, you can just turn around and say, hey, how you doing? Or, hey, you know, isn't it a great day? Because if they're stalking you, a criminal wants easy victims. Once you turn around and you've made them, you've made eye contact, you've spoke with confidence, they think to themselves, shoot, this guy saw me, now I'm going to go somewhere else. And, you know, I train men and women. I have multiple women who have done that, and the person has left because these women were confident and confronted them. So criminals like easy victims, confront them. You don't have to do it in a, a, a bad way or a harmful way, but even saying, hey, do you know what time it is, buddy? And then make an eye contact so they know that you're very aware of them. Yeah, good. Okay, so let's say that um... – either as a professional, well, none, you know, we're not talking about professionals, but let's say you're in a scenario where you, where you have been abducted, right? This is some of the stuff I've seen, the TV segments you did on Rachel Ray and Harry. So, you, um, so you've been abducted. How does that usually, or you're about to be kidnapped, or I don't know which word to use. You're about to be sort of taken by force by somebody else. How does that usually go down? Yeah, I mean, well, obviously you try with everything you have not to be kidnapped. So you're going to make sure you do everything in your power not to get in that car. But if you're overpowered 15 to 1 and you've done everything and you've emptied all your magazines and all that and you end up in the vehicle, well, you've got to start using your memory. You've got to start thinking. So, okay, how many guys were there? Uh, Very important to start leaving DNA clues. So make yourself puke. Cut yourself if you can. Put blood in the car. Uh, Start leaving, uh, quote, unquote, a paper trail. That way the FBI and all the police who are following you can start tracking you. Obviously, you've got to look for that first opportunity to escape. So once you're in the van, you're going to be submissive. You're going to be what's called the gray man where you're not drawing any attention. You're going to act like you're agreeing with them and conceding. And, you know, you're not going to fight back and scream and cuss and say, do you know who I am? Do you know who my father is? Blah, blah, blah. You're going to, again, act very submissive. Now, it's an act because as soon as you find that window of opportunity, you're doing whatever you have to get out. Um, of course, you know, it's helpful to, you know, know how to escape duct tape and rope and how to uh, escape handcuffs and all that. 
And, you know, I'm, I'm going fast here because there's only so much I can tell you. That's a, you know, a, a two-day seminar in itself on hostage rescue techniques. But yeah. leave clues, leave DNA, you know, carry items with you that will help you escape and try and remember everything. You know, where are you going? What sounds do you notice? How many men are around you? It's, it's all critical stuff that obviously could save your life and get you rescued quicker. Yep. Now, Doc, it seems like you've been in a lot of different scenarios, right, all around the world where there's been civil unrest. Is it? Yeah, unfortunately. I don't, I don't know if I'm causing them or if they just follow me. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I've been in a few, yeah. What are the main, you know, places? Let's say, I mean, I, I tend to think that, um, you know, especially as a man in America, your chances of being kidnapped are relatively low. What are the circumstances uh, where you, I mean, obviously for, I think for young women, it's a lot higher, those chances, right? I guess that's true, Jason, unfortunately. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Doc can certainly take this question, but, you know, if you're going to Mexico, uh, you know, obviously likelihood significantly increases. So it depends on where you're going in the world. Right. That's what I was trying to get at is what are the situations that you could find yourself in? Uh, as a man, just since I am a man and Doc's a man, where, where, you know, your risk of being kidnapped goes up a lot. And I'd love for Doc to jump in, too. Yeah, go, go ahead, Doc. Well, I, I think any time that you can be um, leveraged uh, for, you know, whether it's a ransom or you're, you're carrying, um, obviously, money or you have access to money, you know, simply because you're an American, that can put you as a target. One thing I've, a few times I've, actually been in this situation. One of them was actually a nice domestic. I was on a ferry in the middle of the night headed up to Alaska through the inside passage, and I was standing at the end of the boat, um, big ferry, all alone in the dark, basically, and this big guy came up, you know, and he kind of stood way too close. And I thought, how am I going to deal with this if he throws me overboard? Nobody's going to see this. I'm going to land in cold water. How far can I swim? You know, that's instantly what I thought of because I couldn't get away. Um, of course, I started moving as soon as, as soon as that happened, but I just realized in an instant that could be the end of me. Um, if this, I mean, the guy didn't look very good. He was huge red beard, I remember, and I don't know, must have been 6'5", and just like not, not all there. And I'm just standing there looking at him, and I thought this would be an interesting end right here. How would I get out of this? And then if, do I even know where I am? Let's say I swim to shore. You know, because it's the inside passage, it's narrow. Then what do I do? What do I have with me? What am I carrying? You know, how long am I going to have to crawl or hike to finally get somewhere else? But other times, I um, I was in in uh, East Germany before uh, uh, the wall came down, and um, a military truck came by, and the engine had gone out. So we were nice. There was two of us, and we were trying to push it. And all of a sudden, we were surrounded by soldiers and machine guns on us. And I thought, okay, how do you be as passive as possible? They were scared to death. I don't know why, but it, it just was, you know, instantly flipping a switch. There is nothing, no, go, no gain in pursuing this any further. You know, we're just defeated totally. Meanwhile, we're looking for where to run as fast as we can the moment there's a break. But it was... It was kind of weird. It was a bunch of kids with guns. Um, that's happened in a few places, but most of the time it's, it's more showboating than security. One thing I do want to know is, you know, speaking of something like this, uh, Jason, what do you think of the movie Taken? Well, it's highly entertaining. I think it's a, you know, a great movie entertainment-wise. Uh, obviously totally fictitious. What I always say is if you, know, you're, you showed real spy stuff, the movies would never sell because most of it is very hard work, mundane work. It's not exciting, and it's 1% excitement. Uh, so, yeah, I love it from an entertainment aspect. What do you think about uh, the idea of, I don't know, me mentally making a line and saying, if this line gets crossed and, you know, with whatever measurement you have, that you're just going to fight to the death at that instant rather than kind of playing along and making decisions as you go? I mean, it, I'm, I'm thinking of the reaction time. Do you set a, a point where yeah, I mean, you're I, just, it's I, like I, a trigger point? Yeah, I mean, there's the thing is you can never – I think it's more a mental decision 
of that you can take another life. So I don't think it's like if he crosses X because you you'll know it. Um, my my very first job out of college was a police officer before I joined the CIA, and I remember in the police academy. One of our instructors given that whole lecture of, listen, you know, you may have to take a life one day. If you have any hesitation where, you know, somebody's running at you with a knife or somebody pulls a gun on you, shoot you, that you don't think you could pull the trigger back, then, you know, leave the academy now. This isn't right for you. So it's the same thing of home invasions. You know, I have my gun on my nightstand. It's in a rapid access safe. And, you know, some guy barges into my house, starts running me my family with a knife, you know, it's no hesitation. I've already made that mind up, my mind up. I'm obviously going to protect myself and my family. So I think that's really what it comes down to is that you know that if, if that line gets crossed, you can easily do it. Um, you know, I have zero desire for violence. I have zero desire to get any fight. You know, I've, I've run from a lot of things. And, you know, I've been in instances where two men try to kidnap me, and I, man, I'm very fast when people try to kidnap me. So I will avoid things, but if I can't avoid it, then, again, I've made that decision to make sure and defend myself, and then I'm going home alive. Yeah. yeah. What was the situation? Can you talk about it? Yeah, yeah, I can give you the brief, uh, the brief overview. Is Knowing the baseline of a city is very important, obviously, which simply means how does the city look on average? You know, what is an average day in your town? What is an average day at your favorite Starbucks coffee shop or whatever? And so I was in the city. It was very early morning, and I'm walking, and there's these two guys who are walking towards me, and they're far away, but I'm, I can see them. They're very big guys. They don't blend in with the clothing. They don't look like they should be dressed how they are. It's very weird to be out at this time of the morning kind of thing. And as I was about 25 yards away from them, and this shows how unintelligent these guys were, they actually looked at each other, made eye contact, looked at me, and then spread apart and try to funnel me so I'd walk directly between them on this road. And the moment I saw that, I looked at them, and I just turned the other way and took off, and they took off after me. But like I said, I'm, I'm pretty fast when, you know, I got two big guys coming after me, and that was it. So, you know, I, I'm, you know, I've told that story before, and every once in a while you'll get some knucklehead like, oh, you're such a wimp, I would have beat him up, blah, blah. And I'm like, clearly you have never been in any type of, you know, real government or military danger because, you know, why take the chance of those guys being better trained than you were getting lucky and, you know, I'll, I'll get out of there any chance I can get. Yeah, not only that, what happens if you do beat them up and then the police come and I don't know where you were, but, you know, that can't be very good for whatever operation you were on. And that's 100% true. It reminds me of a funny story. So obviously in the spy world when you're overseas, you need to draw zero attention to yourself. Um, because like you said, if something happens and the police show up, uh, you know, you'll be on record, you're going to give them a f- fake you know, IDs, passports, all that stuff, it's a mess. So a buddy of mine, he was overseas once, he's telling me a funny story, he gets in this car accident, and he says the guy was super polite, it was just a fender bender, he said there was no thing. And the guy's like, oh, no, no, let's call the police, I feel so bad, I want to get a document, so my insurance and my buddy, who's you know, on a CIA mission at the time, is freaking out, this guy's being super nice, he's like, I'm screaming at him not to call the police, don't worry about it, I'm happy, I'm fine. And he said, this guy was like totally innocent, just being so nice. And he said, finally, I had to just like drive away and get out of there because the guy was trying to be so helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's How do you good. know that wasn't, a, that wasn't another operative? Yeah, and you're 100% right. That's why you take no chances. It could have, you're absolutely correct about that. You know, I should tell you, I, um, I was just down in Vegas for the SHOT Show, and one of the things I occasionally do is, is uh, go to places, um, in this case, uh, it basically to study people. And in this case, I went to a QVC or CVS, that's what it was, CVS store, drug store right there on the Strip, and literally spent um, about half an hour, maybe an hour, watching shoplifters and how fast I could read them. You know, at what point did I notice their behavior changed from looking for that, you know, bottle of Coke to um, looking for a way to hide it. And I saw the most amazing things and and it it got to the point where I could just look around the store and find somebody and walk up and hang out near them and watch them take stuff. Obviously maybe everybody in the store was doing that, but it was pretty, pretty amazing because you just see a change or nobody looks behind them. Yeah, situational awareness and all, but literally there are things people do only when they're, they're guilty. 
And it was, um, it was fascinating, just nonstop people walking in, hiding stuff, walking out. Um, but anyway, I've, I've done that a few different places. Just, just watch people stalk other people or look for opportunities. No, you're hundred percent right. First, if everybody had your observation skills, we'd all be a heck of a lot safer. Um, but second, as you pointed out, one thing we do is we do lie detection training. So, you know, here's how to detect deception. And you don't, again, have to be some super government operative and spend years of doing it because human beings exhibit guilty behavior. So naturally, we're not great liars. We're not obviously supposed to steal. So you're right. So as soon as you see those people, they're exhibiting a guilty behavior. And if you know what that guilty behavior it is, it's very easy to pick up on when someone's telling a lie. Yeah, one time I, I ended up calling the cops on this one. I was walking down a street not too far from where I live, and I noticed uh, two guys, and they were they parked their car. They were walking across the street. They stopped, or actually they, they slowed down in the middle of the street and literally looked behind them <laughs> and then kept going. And that was all it took for me to, to think nobody does that. And then I noticed yep. where they parked was actually hidden from where they were going. So you couldn't see their car. It was behind a berm. And I thought, you know, you, they could have parked closer, but they didn't. So then now there's concealment. And so I went back, and I'm kind of watching them. And just, you know, the way they kind of separate and one goes up to the door. I mean, sure, they could have been cops, too. But uh, it was just a couple of things they did that I thought nobody does that. And right. called it in, and pretty soon I, there was a swarm, and they were arrested. So something was going on. Um, but this I, is I in Montana. Called not, yeah, this is in Montana. Called nine one one saying, "I don't know what they're doing, but something, something stinks." You know, and but it was, it was, um, you know, just that awareness of, of noticing and then wondering, why would someone do that? Nobody does that. Yeah. Um, well, that's exactly what it is. I mean, human beings were very habitual, and you know, you always got to ask: Is that normal human behavior? Somebody doing X would they? You know, is this common? And like you said, it's obviously to see those guys who are going to rob the house and their case in the house and all that because it wasn't normal human behavior. Which, if you have your head up, is very easy to pick up on. The next part of this episode is brought to you by the Perry Blade Survival Knife, designed by SAS legend Mel Perry. For more information, visit perryblade.com. That's perry, P-A-R-R-Y, blade.com. Yeah, I have a question for you, a selfish question for you, Jason. So what about, so in New York City, my office is right in Times Square, and there's, well, it's on the north side of Times Square on 50th Street, and there's people who, um, they, they're, they have mental illness. You know, there's people I see almost every day that, basically like stand on the street corner, like shouting at everyone. You know what I'm talking about? Just yep. like shouting crazy stuff all the time. And, you know, mostly almost all the New Yorkers that walk by just completely ignore these people. Cause they're, it's like a daily occurrence, but then every once in a while, like about six months ago, you know, one of them pulled a knife and started running around trying to stab people before the police shot him. So, how do you know there probably maybe there's no answer, but how do you know when someone who has a mental illness is going to snap versus just their usual crazy behavior? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the thing you don't, especially when you're dealing with a mental illness person is because they're mentally ill, they don't exhibit normal human behavior. I can tell you the number one thing is people become desensitized to it and you can, now you can never allow yourself to become desensitized. So, uh, you know, I go to New York all the time, taping shows with, for business and all that. And when I'm walking down the streets, you know, I'm always paying attention to everybody. But if you work in the same office building, past the same homeless person every single day, you stop paying attention. And, you know, if that day happens, when the guy goes nuts on pulls a knife, you're in, you know, you're in bad shape. So what I would say is you can never take anything for granted and always pay attention to your surroundings. I and mean, we keep going back to that, but that's really what it is because, you can't predict behavior. There's this saying, and I'm sure one of you guys will be able to quote it better for me, but, you know, we know an armed society is a polite society, but there's the other saying that says, you know, treat everybody you meet well or something, you know, something like that, but be prepared to kill everybody you meet. And <laughs> it, I, again, I butchered it, you know, I, but what it's essentially saying is, listen, that guy standing behind you in the checkout line, the grocery store could pull out a knife at any minute kind of thing. So, 
never, you know, there's no such thing as predictable behavior. Tell that to people who are in a school when a gunman walks in with a gun or in a shopping mall where, you know, the gunman walks in with a gun kind of thing. So it could happen at any time. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I guess I, when I think about my own personal risk profile, that's probably the riskiest thing I ever do is walk by those guys. I, I really believe that because they, they're so unpredictable. And, and there's yeah, a lot of them. You're, you're talking about uh, uh, James Mathis. Um, his quote, I think, be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everyone you meet. Correct. Yes, that that was what yeah. I was, yeah, that's what I was trying to quote. You know, along that line, I was, um, this happened in New York City. I was down uh, in the southern end with a friend, and I was watching this homeless guy. And he was drunk, and he was off, too. Something was wrong, and what it was was it, it was too cliche. And I, I said to my friend, that's not a homeless guy. That's an undercover cop. And we kind of hung around to see, and sure enough, yeah, it was some kind of sting operation. But the homeless guy was too, too homeless, if you will. Mm-hmm. It was too movie-like. Everything he did, his his actions, the swinging bottle. I mean, it was it was pretty bad acting. <laughs> so that one took it even further. And I thought, that's you guys. You're not homeless. What is this? But I didn't want to get involved with him. But I just watched him. I thought, this is ridiculous. That's really but, good. Yeah, that, reminds me of the, that reminds me of the story of the cops back in the day posing as homeless guys, yet they wore brand new white sneakers. So everybody knew they were yeah. really cops because homeless guys don't have white sneakers kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. So that'd be a dead giveaway. Yeah. But that, that makes me think about the next topic I want to talk about with you, Jason, is sort of tradecraft skills. You know, we all see it in movies, but what's the spy stuff that's actually real? Or, you know, maybe you could just pick some of your favorites. Well, I mean, for the average person, they're not going to use a lot of this. So dead drops, where a dead drop is simply, you know, you're dropping a message. And, you know, back in the day, they had coins that were hollowed out. Um, Dead drops have been inside of dead animal carcasses. They, you know, the fake rock is another example. So, you know, that's real spy craft. Um, Signaling your asset to meet them, such as, let's say you have a meeting with somebody. Um, There have been chalk marks on walls. There have been pins put on park benches. So those little white pins you stick on the side of a park bench, the asset drives by. If he sees a red pin, then he knows to meet you. If he sees a blue pin, that means a board mission. Or, you know, I'm just giving quick examples. So dead drops, uh, signal sites, all that's real. Brush passes. A brush pass is simply you're walking by somebody in the crowd and very quickly handing them a message or putting a message in the pocket. Uh, Clearly, you know, we're we're not going to do that type of stuff the average Joe now. But the one thing that we talked about earlier, which is very important, is the surveillance detection route. So, you know, everybody can do SDRs, and I highly recommend that. But the other thing is, in the spy world, you know, we talked about the gray man, is that you want to be invisible. A great spy is somebody who can go somewhere, and nobody remembers his name, he was there, what he looks like, because you're the most invisible, boring, plain person there. And that's what I recommend on a daily basis. I mean, don't make yourself stand out. Don't walk around with your giant necklace of gold or, you know, your wife's four-carat diamond ring on her finger, the Ferrari or whatever trappings of wealth. I mean, God bless capitalism and all that. But be very careful if you're walking around flaunting that stuff. Yeah, so what's, so, how do you, so what's a good way to be the gray man? Like, I've, I've seen in movies where they say, you know, a guy in a bit in a regular business suit can get away with anything like for more urban environments. Is it more like dress like that? Or I, you're probably going to say dress more like what everyone else is dressing like. Yeah, exactly. It's the environment. I mean, New York City, absolutely wear the business suit. Um, I'm in small town Utah and I, you know, jeans and a T-shirt kind of thing. So you've got to know your environment. It depends on where you're going at overseas. I mean, if you're going to certain overseas countries, you're certainly not going to be in business suit because that'll make you stick out like a sore thumb. So it's all about where you're at and then just follow what everybody else is doing. I mean, that's one thing that we as Americans have a hard time doing is respecting other cultures. So we want to go overseas and yell at everybody why they don't speak English and why they're not doing this and that, which is why a lot of countries think we're obnoxious. So figure out what they're wearing and just blend in. It's, I mean, again, it's easy to do, especially when you can do all the research on the internet these days, or most of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm working on a, an article. It's 
on the gray man theme, except I'm calling it the transparent man. And the reason is because sometimes you can't turn yourself into somebody else. Um, you don't have the, the clothing with you or you end up in this strange environment or you're in an unusual situation. So the idea behind being transparent is to give a narrative that makes sense so people ignore you. Um, you've given yourself a purpose and then you're sharing that purpose. Um, you know, it's like if you were dressed in a police uniform, well, the way you turn transparent is you are a cop. You know, but if you are a bank robber in a police uniform, you know, things don't go right. So you have to pretend you're something else and then people ignore that. I mean, I've used that. I think I told the story about getting caught in a kind of a pre-riot in France once and I pretended I was a photojournalist. You know, so now I'm in the very front taking pictures in people's faces. And guess what? I became transparent. Yeah, you know, you're 100 right. Them, I mean, yeah, gave them a narrative. Sorry, go ahead, Doc. Yeah, I just gave them a, a, something that then they can fill in all the pieces. They answer their own question and they move on to somebody else. Um, and I found that kind of handy, you know, in more than one situation. But it's having those, those personas that you can, you can think, okay, what could I be that doesn't matter around here? And become that. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. I mean, when you're we're in the government, when you're in the intelligence community, you know, you don't go overseas and try and pretend to be something that doesn't make sense. So your cover story or legend, you know, if I go to Mexico, I'm not going to say I'm Mexican clearly. So you say, hey, you know, I'm a businessman with whatever, something that makes sense that everybody else, all the other Americans are doing in that country. So it's like, oh, yeah, and you don't draw attention. So it's, you know, it's very, very easy. And one of the most important things to do kind of just a spy tip for anybody that's going into business is one of the favorite sayings is parallel the truth. So if you're going overseas, parallel the truth as much as you can. So I've got a wife and three kids. I'm not going to go over there as a single guy because it's easier for me to say I have a wife and three kids because I really do. So, you know, I'm not going to go over there and say I'm a a biologist or, you know, a rocket scientist because clearly I'm not and clearly I don't know anything about being a rocket scientist. So parallel the truth, and it makes it a heck of a lot easier to live your cover. Good yeah, that's, yeah, that's very good. Um, all right, so let's talk about some of the courses that you uh, that people take. You know, what what do the average people do? What kind of people take your courses? You know, it really is the average American. I mean, it's conservative people who value their safety. So you name a background, I've probably trained that back, trained them from teachers, nurses, doctors, lawyers. You know, we've got CEOs and celebrities, of course, but it's, it really is the average American. And kind of our flagship course, which most people take, is called it's our two-day spy escape and evasion course, where you learn how to escape duct tape, how to pick locks, um, how to disappear without a trace, how to become a human lie detector, you know, how to escape handcuffs and, and all that stuff. And it's a really intense two days um so we've trained thousands of people at that course you know, we have so many other stuff we do rifle pistol um, we have a two-day evasive driving course where people get to ram cars and bust through roadblocks and do 180 reverse turns and all that so yeah. it's it, it's fun stuff but it's also fun stuff that could save your life and do you get survivalists, people who think, uh, you know, the end of the world as we know it is coming? I don't mean in a biblical way. I mean, I think you know what I mean, in a total financial collapse or a total, you know, nuclear event, that kind of a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we get, seriously, we get all walks of life. We get the guy who is just like, hey, I'm taking this because I just want my family to be safer. And then we get the guy who says, hey, I think the, the market's going to collapse next month. The world's going to end. We're all going to be dead. And I want to be prepared. So, it, you know, it really is a, a wide array of people. There's quite a few places in the world today where, you know, there really is no rule of law, right? Have you spent much time in any of those places? Fortunately, not anymore, no. So I, uh, you know, benefit of being in the private sector now is, you know, I get to choose where I go. And for, for instance, Mexico, you know, I got so many people who are trying to bring me down there. And I know a lot of people who go down there, but I, I'm not going to go in the country anymore. Just not interested. No, thanks. You know, we've had companies try to hire us, And I say, hey, come up to Las Vegas. I'll meet you there. So, you know, unless the government comes calling on me or something like that, I'm, I'm trying to stay out of the dumps of the world and, and, you know, make sure I'm home for my three kids. Yeah. And Mexico, is that basically the number one country for the chance of being abducted? It is. It is the, uh, yeah, the kidnapping country of the world. More kidnappings happen there than anywhere else. 
And I also heard that one of the most likely ways you get kidnapped in Mexico is by your own bodyguard that you hired. Oh, yeah, it's anything. It's by your own bodyguard. It's by, you know, wealthy people who uh, get off the airplane and go to the guy who's holding the sign that says Mr. Smith. And, you know, the uh, Mr. Smith, their driver is really not a driver. You know, he's somebody there to kidnap them. So, yeah, there's just, you know, everybody's taking bribes, getting paid off. Corruption is rampant. So you've got to be very, very careful. And is that the whole country? I mean, does that include the sort of resort areas like Cancun or Tulum? Obviously, there are places that are much safer than other places, just like any country in the world, just like here in the U.S., but those still face corruption. Those still have people getting murdered. You know, there's not a resort you can go to, Acapulco or wherever, where there hasn't been some, you know, horrific crime. So I just, like I said, there's many places that are beautiful around the world. You don't need to go to those Mexican resorts. What are the kind of stuff we should be prepared for? What are the biggest threats of 2017? So there are two big threats. And the thing is, obviously, none of us are God. None of us can predict the future. So we have no idea when these are going to happen. You know, they may happen in our lifetime. We all may be long and dead by the time they happen. But one huge threat is always going to be the economy. It's always going to be an economic collapse. So I was reading an article the other day where I think Obama had a added to the national debt by 86%, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars. Eventually, there's going to be a day of reckoning. You know, we've seen all the stuff going on in Venezuela right now, people starving, eating out of trash cans, you know, their economy collapsing. So we are going to have that day when the dollar collapses, when, you know, bad stuff's going to happen. And who, who knows how long it's going to take the government to fix that? You know, is it 30 days? Is it six months? So that's one thing, is the economy will implode. Nobody knows when. And then the other thing, which is is a blackout. I mean, if you read any of the stuff on our grid, our grid is old, it's unprotected. It's a for-profit grid, so a lot of companies don't want to invest money for the proper security because obviously they want to make a profit. And with the Chinese and Russians, you know, hacking us like crazy, sending cyber attacks like crazy, the grid will go down. And it's just like everything else. Will it go down for a week, a month, or a year? Nobody knows. Nobody has that answer. But it will likely go down, and it will likely be for a long time. And when it happens, you've got to be prepared. Um, so those are, those are probably the two biggest threats. If I had to guess, uh, you know, some type of blackout and then the economy taking a, a nosedive big time. I think those are that's really astute. Uh, we did an episode about Ted Koppel's book Lights Out. I don't know if you read that, but uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I was just I was on a business trip in Baltimore this week, and I've been wanting to read it forever. And somebody just handed me a copy, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the book because I've heard great things about it. Yeah, the gist of it is that you know it's a lot of uh, custom pieces that are very hard to build and ironically they take a lot of electricity to build some of these pieces so if the (laughs) grid goes down it's a chain reaction there's no electricity to build them and they all have to be built individually so i think well um, yeah and we've built up the infrastructure around them so it's not like you can easily access them you know to replace them when they're the size of small buildings that's exactly right. And each one has to be built individually, two specs, and you've got to build it somewhere else because we, we wouldn't have any electricity here, so, or not any reliable electricity. But so, we don't have know. the factories to build them in the first place. Also true. They're, they're made in yeah, overseas mostly. Or they were made before we lost all our factories, right? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah there's probably some. Could be 18 months before uh, the power comes back. And in 18 months, there's going to be a lot of abductions and murders and rapes and whatever, I would say, right? So, you you know, you do have to be prepared. Yeah, we we know that most cities are going to collapse within 72 hours if they even last that long. So, yeah, after three days, it will not be good. Yeah, that's right. Is that that why you're you're in southern Utah? Well, it's funny. I'm born and raised in the Washington, D.C. area, so northern Virginia, just a few miles outside of D.C., and, yeah, as soon as I left the agency, I got out of there. I mean, it was just crowded and traffic and a terrible place to be if things go bad, because obviously D.C. area is a target. So, yeah, I'm in southern Utah in a nice small town, you know, like-minded people who are uh, self-reliant, resilient, and, you know, plenty of land here, water and all that. So, so yes, it's a good place to be. I'm very happy my family's still not in northern Virginia or D.C. 
And yeah, yeah I, no, I, I hear you. <laughs> I think that's smart. And Doc's in Montana, and Joel, who's our mutual friend, moved from D.C. to Colorado for that reason. I, I'm the only fucker that's still out here in the uh, <laughs> in in the ur- urbanopolis. Uh, and what about? I, I have to ask, but it's being a bit provocative. But what what about some? president trying to take dictatorial powers and then a, a, a rebellion or a resistance. Is that a possibility in your mind? Well, I mean, we don't have to say we don't have to stretch far for that now. Shoot, anything is a possibility. I mean, we all know Trump is a wild card. You don't know who the real Trump is going to stand up one day from the next. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, from, from what I've seen in life, nothing will surprise me. I don't think anything is is, you know, impossible. So that's why you have to be prepared. That's why you got to have your food storage, your water storage. You know, you have to be able to rely on nobody else but yourself. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, who knows what we're going to see these next four years. Could be craziness or could be awesomeness. Don't know. <laughs> so what I, I other agree things? with that assessment. Yeah. Uh, what, I'm curious, you, you do spend a little bit of time talking about items, specific things, and we've mentioned – you know, uh, having a firearm, having a knife, handcuff keys, um, I assume a flashlight's in there. What, are, what would be the next level? I mean, is the, you had mentioned your lock-picking tools. Is that out of the reach of most people or at least the skill set? And then what besides that, you know, might be the, the next level everyday carry for somebody who's interested? Yeah, I mean, lock-picking, I can teach you how to pick locks in 30 minutes, so it's not – not an incredibly difficult skill to learn and you know we we teach that during our class so it, you know the average person can easily learn how to pick locks and it comes in more useful than you think you know I've had people lock themselves out of their house or help neighbors get into their house or filing cabinets and all that kind of stuff so I would encourage people to learn lock picking and you know we like you said we talked about the guns knives um, you know a shim so a hairbrush could be used as a shim to pick handcuffs you can use a bobby pin to pick handcuffs I mean I'm I'm all about always learning you know these skills to me are obviously fun I enjoy them or I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing but you never know so it's you know I don't believe in sitting on the couch and not bettering yourself I, I don't think you know once you leave school you don't leave school you're always trying to learn you're always trying to be a student. And so I think the next level is, you know, you've got all your, all your everyday carry gear, and obviously you've got to have your bug-out bag in your car, you've got to have them in your home, and then you've got to have me, I personally believe, a year's supply of food, 30 days worth of water storage, and all that. So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot, but you build it up slowly. You know, most people don't buy a year's supply of food overnight, but you can easily build it up by a little bit here each week, and after 52 weeks, you got it. Well, I think that's great. I think that's uh, all the time we have, unless you have one last question, Doc. Oh, well, I, I have always lots of questions, but how about this? What does something cost um, that you provide? Let's say an evasive driving course or a lock picking class. Yeah, it depends. We have videos. So we have videos that are very affordable, and the videos are $47. And then we have our very intense high end classes that are $1,500 for the class. So you know, I realize people obviously have all different economic levels and abilities to travel. So if you can't travel, make it. Hey, 47 bucks, you're getting the best deal ever. If you can't make it, 1500 bucks is still, you know, the best deal ever. Cool. Well, I'll save my pennies. <laughs> I want to crash some cars, actually. <laughs> hey, you're all more right. than welcome. It's a blast. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, and uh, really good insights. I would love to have you on again to talk through some more specifics. Uh, about, you know, a very specific topic, but I think that was just a great overview of where you are with your really unique skill sets and the, and what you teach. So, uh, thank thanks you. so I much. Appreciate it. I'll, be, I'll be happy to come back. You just let me know. Okay. I'll take you up on Excellent. that. You've been listening to the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Buhali, Doc Montana, and Matt Gould. Brought to you by Survival Cash, Forge Survival Supply, Epic Water Bottles and Filters, and the Perry Blade. Please visit our website, thesurvivalistpodcast.com, for more information.